Thank you all for coming to the A2 CAF Small and Indie Press. Uh, we are honored to have with us Rosemary and Atelka. Right? Um, we're going to have another conversation with them, and it's going to be a good time. I will pass it off to you guys. Thank you. Hi. I'm Atelka Lahoski, and I write about comics for NPR. I've been doing that since about 2012. And I'm just thrilled to be able to introduce Rosemary Valero O'Connell. Uh, her books include Don't Go Without Me, Golden Record, and with Mariko Tamaki, Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me. She, she's also worked on comics for DC and Boom Studios, and she has won four Ignatz Awards, a Harvey Award, has been nominated for a GLAAD Award, and received an honorable mention for the Prince Award by the Young Adult Library Services Association. Um, so uh, do you want to maybe uh, tell us a little bit about your work in, in kind of your way? And then I'm going to ask a few questions, and then we'll leave some, question, some time for questions from you guys at the end. So get them queued up. Thank you so much, and thank you all so much for coming. It's really lovely to get to be here in Ann Arbor. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Rosemary Valero O'Connell. I uh, am from Spain originally, but I've been living in the US for quite a long time. Um, I went to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and got a BFA in comic art uh, in 2016. So I do have a degree in this for no particular reason. Um, <laughs> and I uh, have basically been working full time in comics uh, ever since then. I started, um, and I have, um, <laughs> so uh, I think if, if someone is familiar with my work, they are probably most familiar with Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me, which uh, was the first uh, graphic novel. The I'd, I'd worked, um, I kind of got my career started uh, doing projects for Boom, uh, Lumberjanes, things like that. Um, I started freelancing when I, uh, in my like sophomore year of uh, art school, so I, kind of got uh, my foot in the door in the comics industry doing covers, um, did a few yeah, covers for, for some DC comics. Um, I do illustration work on the side as well. If anyone in this room works as a cartoonist, you know that most of us are pretty multidisciplinary and kind of have to wear a lot of hats um, to have a functional career in this industry. Um, but Laura Dean uh, was, uh, I guess, sort of my my what felt to me like my breakout um, book. I uh, was contacted to do it uh, by first second, like I said, in my, I think my final year of, of college. And I uh, was introduced, uh, <laughs> well, not introduced. I was incredibly familiar with <laughs> Marinko's work. Uh, Skim was the graphic novel that made me want to do this for a living. Um, it was the book that kind of showed me that there is something uh, so unique and so special about the language that comics speaks. Um, and that made it feel worthwhile for me to dedicate my life to this. So getting to work with her uh, right out of college was kind of, um, I don't know, it's been years since this book has come out and I still kind of pinch myself that uh, I was the one that got to make it with her. Um, but yeah, I, uh, Laura Dean is uh, sort of the largest, the largest graphic novel that I have out right now. I've been working for the last uh, two-ish years uh, since its publication on my next book with First Second, which is an original graphic novel that I'm writing and drawing. Um, but because it is over 500 pages, it is taking a little while. Um, it's too long. It's, uh, it's really, there's no reason for a book to be that long. Um, um, and I, oh, yeah, so some pages from Laura Dean, just to give anyone in the room who's not familiar with me an idea of what I do and how I draw. Um, I have also done, uh, I have kind of worked in not every space in comics, but I, you know, I've worked on um, sort of more commercial IPs. I did uh, some Lumberjanes and Gotham Academy stuff. I've also worked in the realm of graphic novels, as you can see, but I, I, I really kind of come from the indie scene and the zine scene. Um, that was sort of how I got my start. Uh, that was how I met a lot of the editors that I work with now, um, and it's still kind of weird my heart is at a little bit. So um, I do, you know, the the big books are kind of what uh, the bread and butter of how I make my money, but uh, smaller, shorter form projects um, that give me more creative freedom are kind of, are always going to be, I think, a big part of sort of my uh, creative ecosystem. And so I've uh, done a lot of work with Shortbox, um, who is an, an incredible, an incredible, incredible, like small press out of the UK. Uh, they run an incredible digital comics fair. Um, I did uh, my first, uh, or a book 
This book, What is Left, um, was the first project that I did with them, and it was uh, the first project I ever did that got nominated for an Eisner, um, and it's been, it's since been collected uh, into a little triptych of short stories, uh, short science fiction called Don't Go Without Me, which is, uh, as you can see right here, um, been translated into a few languages. Um, I've gotten to travel with this book to a lot more places than I ever thought comics would let me travel to. Um, and yeah, I, I currently am in the process of, uh, like I said, making, uh, working on kind of my next graphic novel, um, working on my next two graphic novels. Um, but I also, uh, I've done a lot of illustration work. Uh, you know, I've worked um, in animation. I've worked, uh, I did a little bit of design work on the last Spider Burst movie. I've worked a little bit um, on backgrounds, on OKKO OK video games. Um, you know, the <laughs> like I said, I think most cartoonists are pretty omnivorous when it comes to the type of work that we do and the type of drawings that we do. But um, but yeah, my uh, my truest passion is and probably always will be comics. So this is uh, I don't know what I would like to spend the rest of my life doing if I can. Um, yeah, we'll leave it there, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, you had such an interesting upbringing that I think many of us would find unusual. And I wonder if you'd like to talk a little bit about what it was like dividing your time between the American Midwest and Spain. Sure. Um, they are probably two of the most culturally different places. Um, maybe not the most, but it was, um, I don't know, I think it's a provided quite a lot of, I don't know, I think anyone who is, is fortunate enough uh, to leave whatever community they are brought up into and to be able to, uh, you know, live in a different community, I think it adds, it brings a lot of perspective um, or it brings a lot of, a, I don't know, I think you understand uh, very early on how small you are in the world in a very positive way um, and how much world there is out there. Um, I feel very lucky to, uh, just to, to bring it back to comics, I feel very lucky to have grown up bilingual and bicultural because I've been able to um, really interface with the comics community in Spain in a way that would be harder for me to do as an outsider. Um, there's a lot of really incredible Spanish-speaking cartoonists, you know, not just in Spain, but all over uh, the sort of, you know, Spanish-speaking world. Um, and I feel really lucky to, you know, be able to sort of have a different type of access to that type of work and those types of spaces. Um, because there's some truly, truly, truly incredible work going on outside of, you know, we have sort of the main American market, the French market, the Japanese market, but um, yeah, Spain has got some really, uh, <laughs> some really fantastic artists following in a really fantastic tradition of art, you know? Yeah. You know, in an interview, you mentioned that um, sort of Spanish-style Roman Catholicism mm -hmm. had, had a big influence on you aesthetically, and I wonder if you could maybe um, elaborate on that a little bit for us. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think my first experience of, you know, what all of us who appreciate art experience at some moment, which is you, uh, you see something so beautiful that it moves you in a way that is almost physical. It has a physical effect on your body. It changes like the chemistry. It moves the furniture around in your brain. I think, uh, I'm not a practicing Catholic by any means, um, but I uh, grew up in a city that was just surrounded by, um, there were these cathedrals that, you know, the, the goal of a space like that is to inspire awe through visual beauty, you know, to like find the divine in aesthetics. And I think that, uh, that idea of sort of trying to create an image, um, a, a piece of art, a piece of work that through its beauty alone um, can kind of connect to something emotional in you, um, I think the roots of that are kind of in Catholic architecture for me, you know, and in the sort of, a, I don't know, um, making something gilded and ornate and lovely and uh, devoting time and attention to make it lovely so that it'll, uh, yeah, to exalt its subject matter, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I mean, it seems like actually even looking at this picture is, is, a, is an example um, that y your style seems to be about having having these majestic and and very clean lined kind of framing spaces but then also filling in lots of ornament mm -hmm. and i i'm and it seems like you um are very much th that th those two things can be opposed i mean mm -hmm. lots of people um want when they think of a majestic space they think of an of an empty space mm -hmm. of, a, of a minimalist space but that's not you at all is it no i mean i, I think it's a twofold where i've always really responded to art that is you know 
decadent and luxurious and sort of full, uh, full to the brim of, of detail and richness. I come from manga, you know, that's what got me into comics, um, particularly like shoujo manga, you know, like Motohagyo's work, which is incredibly decadent and has uh, this sort of focus on uh, ornamentation without only being ornamental, you know, um, being uh, searching for beauty in a way that, you know, um, doesn't come at the expense of the narrative, but serves to sort of, you know, elevate the narrative. Um, and I also just, uh, I think because comics is what I do full time, it's, you know, it's the thing that I spend the most hours of my days doing, I have tried to, in the last few years especially, really figure out what it is about the physical act of drawing that I find the most enjoyable. And what I find the most enjoyable is just, drawing forever, you know, like filling in, um, working in detail, creating a, a space or a panel or just a, a moment on a page that feels lived in and that feels possible to live in. And, um, you know, that sort of like traps you for a second and keeps you, uh, you know, I think it's the, the plight of many cartoonists, especially that draw very detailed work, is that, you know, you spend hours and hours and hours on a page, but it takes a second to kind of take in the information. So I, as much as I can, try to kind of, you know, put down like a little honey trap that will keep yeah, people on the say, page for a little bit longer. <laughs> I mean, your work doesn't take a second. Every page you want to just study it, and oh, it's got you. so much happening. Do you ever have a hard time kind of corralling all that detail, or do you go back and take things out sometimes or rearrange a lot? Yeah, I do, because I, um, I've found that you know, uh, there's a level of detail that can just become noise and that can just become mud, you know, if it's not paired with, uh, I think the secret is kind of knowing when to go all in and when to pull back in order to like let what you've done have space to breathe. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I definitely, I, uh, I think I, I try to consider the design of like the individual panel, the individual page and the spread um, as much as I possibly can. Um, and so, you know, if I've done, a page that feels too, that just upon first glance doesn't uh, doesn't seem to work, doesn't feel correct. I'll I'll go out, I'll take things, I'll take things out, I'll add things in. I'm very much, um, I think, to kind of the chagrin of my editors. I'm a person who, until the comic is printed, I am still working and changing <laughs> things and like messing around with it, which I think makes me very difficult to work with. <laughs> but um, but it's yeah, it's a living thing until it's printed for me. That's great. <laughs> Boy, I, I say, hey, why not? Make it hard for editors. That's their job. <laughs> That's their job to deal with that stuff. You know, this is kind of a weird question, but mm -hmm. I wonder if you, your, your style is, is so you. I mean, I, mean I, I can't look at a page by you and, and, and not see you. Oh, and I you. wonder if you learned to draw, to draw the way you draw now. Or did your style, has your style evolved from something, when you look back at your mm. earliest efforts, are they very different? Or, is, or do you still see the same kernels of theme, the oh. themes that are in your drawing? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I definitely feel like I have been kind of like polishing this, like sharpening the same knife for a while, where I feel like I sort of have had an idea of what I would like my art to look like that I have been pursuing and that I will continue to pursue because it's, you know, an una it's unattainable and really? it's going to be... What's out of reach? What's out of reach for you? Well, I guess I, when I, I, I always find that the, uh, what I'm able to visualize is always going to be a few paces ahead of like the skill of my hand, you know, and I like it that way, you know, I think there's a, there's like a joy in knowing that I will never plateau and I will never like reach, uh, I will never be the artist that I want to be, but in like a joyful way, and that like I always have that to work for, and I always have, there's always going to be a, a direction for me to grow in. Um, but I, I think that like many people, my style now is absolutely just a, an amalgamation and a reinterpretation of all of my influences, just kind of filtered through the prism of what uh, my hand can do, you know? Um, I grew up, I, I, I taught myself to draw, again, I think the way that a lot of us have, just by like tracing, you know, going to the library and like picking up a volume of like, please save my earth and like copying all of the panels that I thought were the most beautiful. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I think, uh, I think there is just, there is a part of style that feels unavoidable where it's like I just, the, my natural inclination is to just, uh, make shapes look like this, to make bodies look like this, to do, um, and some of that is 
intentional, but a lot of it doesn't feel like it is. A lot of it feels like I don't quite have control over it, and it's just... Necessary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That must be a wonderful feeling. I mean, it's, it's funny, because um, like as a writer, you know, you always have to pare back and you always have to go back in and say, okay, what is necessary? Mm -hmm. And I feel like I feel like when I look at one of your panels, I, I see that intelligence behind everything that's placed oh, there. That's very kind of you. Um, it, I mean, is that is that what what happens? Like like as you're drawing, like wait, that needs to go. That's not. Yeah, inevitable. I think for me at least, you know, there's a, a, yes, there's a part of comics that requires quite a bit of of you know thought and being discerning and being specific, but a lot of it does feel like instinct and does feel like I am just. Uh, like I'm clearing moss off of a statue that already exists, you know? I am trying to, like the shape of this is already there, I'm just searching for it. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah, I, uh, there are parts that are very fun to sort of, um, to really think through, to solve like the problem of, again, how to lay out a page in a way that is both communicative um, and also lovely, you know? That's kind of the, my favorite, I don't know, my favorite, uh, challenge of comics is just uh, not losing, you know, the story is king. Um, and so sort of not losing sight of what is necessary in order to like convey information in the way I want it to be conveyed, but also it's a visual medium and I'm, you know, I'm very, <laughs> I'm very shallow in the way that I like, I love, um, I just love a beautiful drawing. <laughs> um, and so trying to find a way to, to incorporate as much of the things that I, again, it's all kind of about the physical pleasure of drawing for me, of finding, um, ways to draw the stories that I want to tell in a way that is the most exciting for me both to look at and also to uh, just to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me, you were working with a collaborator, mm -hmm. Mariko Tamaki, and I wonder um, how the kind of process that you've just talked about played out when you're, when you're working with someone who you're collaborating with. I mean, did you send yeah. pages back and forth? What kind of decisions had to be made? Well, she is just about the best um, collaborator that a person could ask for, and I'm 100% grateful to Jillian for that because I think she's so used to working with cartoonists and used to working, I think she really understands the division of labor in the way that sometimes... Oh, so you're saying that Mariko kind of learned from Jillian yeah, how to work, really? Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, I think, you know, she's used to working, as she knows... I might pause. Oh, um, yeah. um, uh, Mariko Tamaki has worked extensively with Jillian Tamaki, mm -hmm. who was our guest this morning. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so our initial collaboration, I mean, she came uh, to me with basically uh, a script like you would have a script for a film. And it wasn't broken down by panels. It wasn't broken down by pages. It was just, this is the story. She had some sort of notes on how every scene was supposed to feel, on sort of the emotion mm -hmm. that she wanted to convey. Um, but that's what she gave me, and that's what I love to work from because I think, again, it's, she understands that uh, it isn't just a division of words and pictures that the storytelling in a comic happens. Uh, yes, there's the written word, but you know, um, the control of time, the control of you know, sort of the flow of a scene. There's so much storytelling that happens there, and that's all you know, the artist. And so she really, really was incredible with me, and just kind of let me breathe through the story and find um, a way to try to sort of translate the story that she uh, already had, that already existed as a novel, essentially, into um, a graphic novel. Um, and we did a lot of, you know, back and forth where she had some very specific ideas that she was like, this is important to me. I want this to sort of be, uh, um, I know it was really important to her that it be recognizably like the East Bay, you know, and things like that. So we uh, did a lot of like scouting explorations and took a lot of pictures of architecture in Berkeley. Um, <laughs> But she also, uh, she said something to me, which I think is very true, which she was like, yeah, it took me, you know, I wrote the script in a few months. I spent a few months with these characters. You are going to spend at least two to three years with them. So by the end of this process, they will be more yours than mine. And so uh, it was very important to her, I think, to kind of let me really feel like ownership of this thing that I was putting so much blood, sweat, and tears into, which is an incredible gift, you know, because she is, uh, for my money, a genius, and I, you know, when I was making Laura Dean, I was like 20. I was, I was kind of a snot-nosed kid, and I was like, <laughs> I would completely understand if this, you know, award-winning, incredible author would want to kind of take the reins from me a little, but she put an incredible amount of trust in me, and so I'm, I'm wherever she is, I, I'm very, very grateful to her. 
You know, I was so struck by, um, you managed to make all these ordinary locations in, in, in Laura Dean seem magical. Mm -hmm. um, like there, there was, um, you know, like a, like a little street market or a restaurant or even the high school gymnasium looked magical and also um, as, if, as if it had been arranged for a ritual. And I wonder if that, if that was something that, like do you, when you look at these spaces, do you think how can I infuse this with something important, something that can make it a special space. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I have this conversation sometimes with, I have a lot of friends who work in animation and in comics, I think there's this really wonderful thing where you have, you only have so many panels, you know, you only have so many images of a particular scene, of a particular space, of a particular character. So choosing what you show and how you show it is kind of one of the, again, one of the biggest pleasures of it, of being like, okay, so this is a high school gymnasium, maybe not the most scenic, spot in the world, how can I frame it? How can I display it on the page? How can I like pose it and style it in a way that it's going to, like you said, feel magical or feel like more than it is and feel like a, a space that you would want to be in even if it's just a gym, you know? <laughs> how did you decide to use pink as your color? Um, it was a, a little bit, <laughs> we've sort of like, uh, <laughs> We've um, retconned it to be a very conscious choice and to be like, well, it's a romantic color and it's like a youthful, you know, millennial pink. But it really was um, the original, the test pages that I did, um, because the way that that process worked was Callista Brill, who is my editor, uh, reached out to me and she's like, hey, we'd really want you for this project. Um, we are like essentially auditioning artists to work on it. Um, and so I did, uh, the test pages that I did were in that sort of black and white with the pink tone. Um, because I'm such a line-based artist, I kind of prefer to work in really limited colors uh, just because I feel like it it helps, uh, I almost feel like an excess of color combined with an excess of line can sometimes just feel like a lot. And I feel like there's a clarity um, and like an immediacy that I'm able to get to with my images if I just have you know a few kind of choice colors. Um, and they liked it and it felt, again, thematically appropriate. Um, it's not a very romantic book, but uh, it felt kind of, you know, um, nice to have a sort of, yeah, a very, like a sweet and romantic color as There's our little. of irony, I think. Yeah, yeah, as our accent. As, this, as these um, heartbreaking things are happening, yeah. they certainly do not feel sweet or romantic yeah. to the characters. <laughs> I wondered, um, uh, Let's see. Were, oh, were there specific spreads that, that took a long time to get right? Or did, or did it all, um, I mean, especially yeah. like at that time, at such a young age, like w were you really having to kind of find your way in order to um, uh, sort of, like did you have to go back and redraw things? Or? Yeah, I mean, mostly because uh, before Laura Dean, the longest comic I'd ever worked on was like 20 pages or something, and Laura Dean is like 350, so it yeah. was a completely different beast. And by the time I, a beast. yeah, <laughs> yeah, and by the time I was done drawing every single page, my style had changed. Because again, I was, I was young. I was in still this, you know, kind of early development of who I was as a cartoonist. So this book taught me a lot about how to draw and how to make comics. And it was a lot of, you know, learning as I was doing. Um, my style was like developing, I was developing it through working on this book. Uh, so by the, the final pages looked nothing like the first ones, um, or not nothing, but you know, there was, you could see the growth, which was kind of lovely for me, but also I had to go back in and be like, okay, let's update, <laughs> update a little bit with what I now know about uh, this medium. And uh, yeah, it definitely, I, when I was reading through the script for the first time, there were some scenes that just like, you know, Athena from Zeus's head just kind of like sprang out fully formed. And I was like, this spread is like, I think the spread of, uh, there's a spread of Doodle and Freddy. Wait, doodle, doodle. This, yeah, like I, this was the first, actually the first two pages that I drew just because I was reading through, um, I was reading through the script and it just, uh, there was a moment, you know, um, reading through the script, it sort of played out like a movie in my head and this scene, or like the cinematography of this scene felt very immediate and very specific. Um, and so it felt like something, again, that I had to nail down before it kind of slithered out of my view again. Um, and there were some, uh, yeah, there were some scenes that I just, uh, in the pencils, I got so enamored with the drawing that in the inking stage and all that, I was like, I want this to be one of the special pages. Like, I want this to be one of the ones that people open up and that kind of draws people into the rest of it. Because 
with a book this big and with a book that has to, again, tell a story as well as just be a design object, um, there are some pages and some panels that just have to be functional. You know, they just have to like get the point across. Um, and I, uh, like I said, as a very, you know, sort of like, <laughs> decadent and shallow person when it comes to the art that I'm um, making. Why do you say that? What's decadent and shallow about you? I'm, I'm mostly <laughs> joking. Um, but, um, but those are my favorite pages to just be able to like really spend hours and hours and hours making, you know. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny that you would, that you would sort of laughingly say decadent and shallow, but I mean, I think maybe what you, what you might mean is that you really care about pleasure yes. for the reader. Yes. Yes. It's a much, a much more generous way of putting it. <laughs> um, I guess I guess maybe we should move to your latest project, Golden Record, mm -hmm. and um, that in that book, the the words and the drawings are you. Yes. And I was wondering which came first. Um, well, that was an interesting project because Golden Record is not um, it isn't comics really. It's a it's a chat book. It's sort of an illustrated poetry project that kind of originated because I was making so many comics, just mm -hmm. traditional comics, and I felt like I had all of these impulses either for writing or for visuals that just didn't seem to fit into a traditional comic format that just didn't really have anywhere to go. Um, and I uh, have always really liked, again, the, the zine space and the indie space is my favorite in this whole industry. Um, and I've always really liked that a lot of the work that I seem to find in those spaces is less concerned with sort of linear narrative structure um, and more concerned with you know the evocation of a feeling. It sort of follows the rules of poetry more than it follows the rules of a novel. Um, and I've always really loved poetry. Um, and so it just, uh, that project kind of, uh, yeah, originated as a, just a, a place to put all of these artistic impulses that were all, um, I don't know, I felt like I had sort of like a, a stone that I was polishing in my mind um, that I just needed to kind of get out of my system so it could leave, uh, I don't know, I'm sure other artists feel like this too, but sometimes it feels like you have to exercise like a, a certain amount of, of stories or of projects so you can clear way for the other ones to, to be able to kind of put roots down. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a big experiment um, and it kind of all, like I said, flowed together very kind of organically. Um, sometimes I would write a poem and then, um, you know, figure out a way to illustrate it that didn't feel too, uh, it was a challenge to not be too literal and to not be too on the nose. Um, and sometimes I would just, you know, um, I would start with a poem, but it would be a visual poem first, you know, and then I would sort of uh, accent it or accentuate it uh, with written poetry. So it's, yeah, and the folks at Silver Spocket were so, I mean, they're an incredible, one of the most incredible publishers that they're we terrific. have. They're amazing. And they're really fantastic for artists because they have a very light editorial hand. They're like, if we like what you do, we want you to do that exactly. And we're not going to mess with it. And we're not going to mess with you, um, which is fantastic. <laughs> did, did, um, had, had you been talking to Silver Sprocket for a while? Or, or, I mean, how did you come to work with them? Um, well, I'd really, I'd loved so much of what they'd published. Um, and I've really, I, you know, the the lovely thing about how small the comics community is, is you just kind of get to know people, you know, you do enough shows, you see a lot of the same faces. Um, and I'd known um, of Avi for a while, and I just really liked their ethos and the way that they approached comics um, with just this massive amount of transparency about this is who we are, this is what we're interested in, this is what we can pay you, this is what we can't pay you, but this is what we can do mm -hmm. because we really care about your work and we're gonna try to put it in front of as many people as possible and we are gonna like stand by it 100%, which is, again, it's just what more could you want as an artist? Um, <laughs> and so I was just, and I knew also that they wouldn't be fussy about the fact that it wasn't strictly comics, you know, that if they liked it, they would be like, yeah, it's, you know, we don't have to categorize it in order to sell it. Um, yeah. What about, um, do, do you ever worry about, about not being understood or about your, like, this is such a personal project. It's mm -hmm. very, it's very idiosyncratic in, in, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And do you, do, do you ever feel like um, th that you're putting something out there and, and, and you're just a little nervous about people just not taking it the right way? Yeah, I think that's, that's a... Uh, I think when you are, you know, vulnerable for a living in some ways, that's always... Vulnerable for a living. <laughs> that is the description of comic yeah, artists, isn't it? Yeah, and so that, that part of it is always, always going to be there, but I, I... Not that I got it out of my system, because it will always be in my system, but I, um, I was so worried. The entire time we were making Laura Dean, I was 
going over every possible way in which our intentions with this book could be misconstrued or just, I don't know, I was, I was trying, I was coming up with all these ways in which people weren't going to like it, were gonna think that it was this, that, or the other. Um, and, you know, then its actual reception happened and it kind of, you know, um, won a lot of awards. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, and also was banned in a lot of schools, you right. know, there's, it's, so it's, it's one of those things where it's just a, it's so impossible to predict um, what anyone will see or won't see in your work. Um, and I've tried very hard to sort of uh, detach myself from the idea that I have any control over that. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I try to be as honest as I can with what I am making and if it's something that I, if I trust that what I have said or what I have done with my work is true to me, then the way that it, you know, lands or doesn't land with another person is kind of not my business. <laughs> um, and I, uh, there's also, I think, a part of it that uh, working in, in YA or having kind of my debut into this world be through YA almost made me want to... Young adult. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, which is a sphere that, you know, especially right now, I think there's a lot of, and especially, you know, as like a gay person making gay comics, I think there's a lot of... Uh, I spent a lot of time making this project worrying about, um, you know, being good representation, all of the, you know, the sort of things that come up, and I... Like, like the whole community is w relying on you. <laughs> right, this, you know, ridiculous and unattainable idea, and the more, the older I get, and the more I feel like my um, work evolves, the more illegible I want to be, and the more, sort of, the less relatability uh, feels less and less important to me in that I feel like I am zeroing in on both my audience and both who I am. And uh, appealing to as many people as possible feels less interesting to me than speaking very directly and very clearly to the people that I feel like share a heart with me, if that makes sense, you know? Do you feel like you've, you've come to that stance partly because the book was banned? Yeah, honestly, kind of. And I think because it is, uh, in so many ways, such an inoffensive book, you know? Like, it, yeah. it's really, <laughs> like, yeah, teenager gets an abortion and gay people talk about sex, but also, you know, like, go outside. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, the combination of that and also seeing the work by my peers that's getting, I mean, the fact that they're banning Heartstopper <laughs> yeah. in schools, one of the most, you know, sort of, uh, uh, people... It's just are, the sweetest little uh, There's nothing, yeah. Um, I think it has very much gotten me to the to the point where it's like there's no uh, there's no level of palatability that I can achieve that will make me like you know not like a dyke to people that you know like it's and so why would I want to make my words my work uh, you know toothless and to like sand the edges off of it and the things that make it specific and the things that make it real when I can't there are people that just are going to hate it because of what it is and because of who I am. And I'm not talking to those people. I'm not making work for those people. I don't want them to engage with my work. Um, so yeah, I think there's a part of that that's like, well, I can't please everyone, so I will try to please the people that are uh, you know, kin to me and the people who I, uh, yeah, just the, the, the audience that I want to speak to. Um, and everyone else will feel however they feel. <laughs> you know, that's such a healthy stance. I feel like you must have had to evolve towards it over a period of years. And yeah. I just wondered, did you have, like when you heard about uh, Laura, Laura Dean being banned, mm -hmm. did you have a, an immediate emotional reaction? And I, I mean, because I can't imagine how I'd feel if I suddenly found out that parents yeah. were organizing against me. Well, I mean, I again, Mariko was an incredible person to have as sort of a companion for this project because she'd gone through it before with this one summer which is like even less you know there's <laughs> there's just so little to be upset about in these books um but she had had that kind of experience of being like oh I have been so wildly misunderstood and so willfully misinterpreted by these people how do I kind of deal with that how do I process that where do I put that and also what can I do to because the emotion that first comes up is for, you know, like the kid, like these books are being banned because they are speaking to children and because they are like, because someone has found it necessary and someone has, and so the, the immediate thing is just a sadness for the people that aren't going to be able to, you know, not in like a, our book is gonna change the world and if some kid can't read it, it's gonna, you know, but, but just in a, you know, the schools that are banning 
books like this are the schools that are populated by kids that need to read books like this the most. And so there's just kind of a, you know, a sadness of, of uh, realizing how, um, just how cruel people can be towards their own children. Um, that is absolutely something that comes up. But I think also I learned the first, uh, the first time that someone talked to me about Laura Dean being banned was in a really wonderful context because it was a group of teachers at a school in Texas reaching out to me and Mariko to be like, hey, some parents are trying to do this. We oppose it. Like, our kids love your book. Do you want to do um, basically like a Zoom call with them to so they can talk to you about the book? And so we can also have a conversation with these kids about what banning books is because, children, you know, like kids aren't stupid. They know what you like. Um, and it was a really, really like edifying experience for me to be able to not only, you know, have the incredible experience of talking to young adults who have resonated with this book, but also to be able to hear what it is like from their perspective to sort of see, you know, their self-expression, their agency being infringed upon in this way. Um, and it, it just, it helped a lot to be like, oh, okay, yes, there are these parents, there are these school boards. Within all of these institutions, there are also teachers and librarians and people who are working incredibly hard to, to counteract, you know, um, these bannings. So, yeah, I, it's, it's, a, it's a strange, it's a very strange experience, again, because it is such a, yeah, I don't know, it's a, <laughs> it was very strange to me that this book of you're all books. Demonized. I mean, you're being cast as some kind of, you know, like, it's like you've got the, the Scarlet A or something, yeah, you know, like, yeah. get that out. Yeah, so, like, <laughs> it's kind of metal, because it's like, yeah, banned books, but also it's, you know, very sad for, uh, you know, yeah, it's just, yeah, bittersweet. Um, we probably have, have people in the audience who um, are, are, are comic artists or would like to be, and mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd like to talk a little bit about the state of the industry right now. Sure. Well, it's a vast industry with a lot of sort of different, uh, you know, pockets, but I, I think it's a really, really exciting time to be making and reading comics. Um, I think that we're, I don't know, in the particular vein that I am in, which is primarily, you know, graphic novels, mini comics. Um, I don't really work with the like big two and sort of in that. Uh, but you've worked for DC, right? I have, I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mostly, again, mostly when I was younger, it's never quite been my uh, like style or my speed. So I, I can mostly speak to like this sort of uh, facet of the industry but I think a lot of we're seeing just a lot more uh, a lot more readership a lot more people who I think haven't thought of themselves as people that read comics um, I think as the industry grows and as we are able to give you know more money for people to make more different types of books we are seeing just like an expansion in people's conception of what graphic novels can be and what comics can be which again as fans we've all I think known for a very long time that this is like such a, a, a plentiful and vast medium that, you know, is, um, can contain so many multitudes and so many different types of stories. But I do think that, you know, the fact that markets at large are kind of starting to see that is fantastic for cartoonists because it means that there's a little more money, a little bit more freedom. I think we're seeing a lot of imprints that are starting to come up. Um, you know, the YA boom is still very much happening and a lot of the people that I know who are full-time cartoonists are working on young adult stuff. There's a ton of readership, there's a ton of money. Uh, some people have been kind of frustrated with that, but I think we are starting to see a little bit of that trickle down um, because those readers grow up, you know? And like you get people, you teach people like the language of comics and you teach people fluency in that and they take that with them, you know? They fall in love with the medium and they keep reading it. And so I see, we're seeing more imprints of, you know, sort of adult graphic novels or just, uh, I don't know, I, I think that the, I'm every year like something new comes out that just knocks me down and like uh, reinvigorates my you know my love and my passion for this medium and that's I don't know it's an incredibly exciting time I think to be making comics. Um, that's so terrific yeah. that you feel that way. Yeah, because you know I mean I think I think it's easy for creators to feel either way. I mean even yeah. even with everything that's going on I think I think if 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 you had said well I feel pretty burned out then I would have been well, like well I could kind of see why and, I mean it's an extremely yes. hard job. Yes, and I you know there is a I <laughs> I feel more compelled to sort of talk about the good parts sometimes <laughs> because it is an incredibly hard industry to make a living in. It is you know uh, most of us very, 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 very few people, even the people who, you know, have won all the awards, who have been working in this for decades. Uh, <laughs> there's very little job security. There's very little, 
I think there is kind of a longevity issue with, with comics where, you know, you can make a couple graphic novels, you can work really, really hard for like a decade and then you kind of crash because it is, uh, there is more money than there ever has been, sort of, but also there's not a lot, you know? Um, and there's, it's just, a, yeah, it's a, I think it takes, again, a combination of, um, there's some tenacity, but also, I feel like I have been able to to work very successfully in this industry because of a lot of circumstances of my life. You know, like I'm I'm unmarried. I don't have a child. Those aren't things I want. Um, I think for people that are trying to, you know, I don't know a lot of cartoonists that are living in the way that uh, the people I know who, you know, say are engineers or doctors are living. Um, but we can carve out, you know, really lovely lives for ourselves, and we can make living, we can make a good living off of this. It's just, you know, maybe our lives have to look a little different than none of us are ever gonna be millionaires, but also, you know, we get to make art every day, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on that note, maybe we'll open it up for some questions. Mm -hmm. Why don't you call people oh, and he'll uh, take them on the mic. Yeah, sure, right there. Hi, uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, you mentioned that you got an MFA in com comics. I was wondering if you, what benefits you thought that conveyed on your career, and what would be the pros and cons Definitely. going that route? Um, yeah, so BFA, so it was an undergrad, it was a four-year undergrad program, um, and I, I, will, I think I can recommend art school and comic school specifically in the capacity that I did it, which was with essentially a full ride scholarship. Um, I applied for a ton of external scholarships. I got a lot from the college that I went to. That made it very worth it to me um, because I am not uh, saddled by debt. And I know a lot of people who went through the same program that I am uh, who had very similar opportunities uh, that I did coming out of school who were kind of unable to act on those opportunities because of the debt that private art school put them in. Um, so I will, <laughs> I think for me, uh, the biggest benefit was community and was, you know, meeting a bunch of artists and being able to work with a bunch of like really, really excited young cartoonists. Um, and just, you know, having four years where your main job is just like honing your craft is an incredible privilege. It's an incredible thing to be able to do. Um, I think I also, uh, I got to go to my first conventions because of like the resources that my school had. We had like a design department that had money set aside that we could, they like paid for me and a few other cartoonists um, in the program to go to MOCA, which is where I met Callista with First Second. So there are a lot of it. First, first Second, the publisher. Yes, the publisher that published Laura Dean. So, you know, there, I, I think it offered me a lot of advantages, but I think those advantages only are worth it if you are not going to uh, ruin the rest of your life essentially by having to pay fifty thousand dollars a year for four years, you know, for someone to teach you about, you know, moment to moment transitions in comics. Um, so yeah, I, I think it was incredibly beneficial to me in ways that I know are very specific to the way that I was able to go to art school. Um, but I think we're also very lucky to have you know, uh, kind of a multitude of places now where you can get the community and some of the arts education that an art school provides through uh, a free or sort of a different resources. You know, there are tons of classes that you can take online. There are tons of community spaces. There are comics meetups in just about every city. And I think the combination of that can provide just as edifying of an experience as going to art school for four years, you know? Hello. Um, you mentioned that you work in one color mostly, and I wondered, is there a colorist you would like to work with? Ooh. Yeah, actually. Um, I, uh, Mickey Quinn, who I think did the colors for Snot Girl, I think is like exceptional. I really, really like, I've had very different experiences with, because I've had colorists work on my work before, and um, I've had, it's run the gamut where I've had, you know, some very like flat color people, which I think works better in my style. I've seen my comics uh, given the sort of like superhero airbrush coloring and it looks ridiculous because that's not how I draw. <laughs> um, but um, I, I would really like to, 
Oh, Ariel Rees, actually. Ariel Rees, who is an incredible cartoonist, uh, does witchy, I think has a graphic novel coming out. For my money is one of the most, I don't think anyone really understands and can apply color as well as they can. So that would be a dream. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, that there are a few uh, books that you've read that uh, either have really impressed you. Uh, what have been some of the most recent things you've read that have really impressed you? Ooh. Um, let me think. I want to give a good answer. I the last um, the last graphic novel I read that I thought was just incredible, and it's older work. Um, the sky is blue with a single cloud. Is a collection of. Kuniko Tsurida, I believe, um, who was a, a, a mangaka in, uh, was basically one of the like only women um, that was making uh, a certain type of like, experimental comic uh, in Japan in like the 80s and the 70s. And I want to say it's fanographics, but it might be drawn in quarterly, uh, put out a really incredible collection of her work. Uh, it's a lot of short stories, um, and it has some of the most incredible use of black spotting of just very, very basic black and white shapes that are insanely evocative that I uh, have seen in a comic in such a long time. Um, and I, uh, I also recently read, uh, well, I didn't read it. I bought a bunch of untranslated volumes of, um, of um, oh my gosh, Daisuke Garashi's work because uh, Children of the Sea is one of the one of my absolute favorite books, which is, is one of my favorite books. Um, and there's a lot of his work that just hasn't come across the seas yet. So I um, have been slowly trying to <laughs> like translate word bubble by word bubble um, these volumes of his that I got. Um, I also, I mentioned Shortbox earlier, but the Shortbox Comics Fair is like a digital comics fair that's going on right now. I picked up, um, there's a, a book by L. Shivers, a book by uh, Madeline McGrain. Honestly, just going through their website and combing through, there are hundreds of mini comics by such a wide variety of people. Honestly, every single one of them has, you know, something, uh, something special about it. So I really recommend that. Um, and then uh, the Chromatic Fantasy, which is a, a graphic novel that just came out um, from HA from Silver Sprocket. It's one of their first big, big graphic novels. Um, it's his first comic ever. He's like a very, very young cartoonist, and he just came out the gate with this incredible fantasy comic. It's full comic, a full comic, full color, um, uh, about this uh, trans guy who escapes a nunnery and uh, goes on to have these like incredible adventures. Uh, there's romance, there's blood, there's the devil. Um, it's just incredible. I recommend it to everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, so um, don't go without me. I, one of the things that strikes me the most about that book is how innovative and how creative the panel structuring is. You just Every page flip is just a new, I don't know, adventure to look at. So I guess my question is, like, how do you get there, right? Is this through a lot of like really detailed thumbnailing? Is it through moving stuff around like the moderator was telling you about? Is it just intuitive? How do, how do you get to those kinds, because it's not like six panels a page, mm -hmm. six panels a page, like that. So how do you how do you get to that kind of panel structure? Um, well, I, I think it is, it's a great question. I, I do think a combination of it is my, like I said, my influences are largely shoujo manga, and I think one of the things that shoujo manga is just so incredibly adept at is uh, not sacrificing the beauty of a page um, for, or I don't know, knowing how to, like I said, use the uniqueness or the beauty of a page to sort of uh, to underline uh, whatever narrative point um, is happening on that same page. Uh, and I think that's something that I've really taken with me into the way that I think about my work. Um, I The book that I'm working on right now, The Twelfth House, I set kind of a challenge for myself, and it's a very silly challenge because it is a 500-page book, but I was like, I don't want... I don't want any two pages to be structured in the same way. I don't want the same panel structure on any two pages. Um, Quite a yeah, but it's been, it's fun. I don't know, it really, it's a, uh, again, there's that like um, finding a way to make working for three years on these books like feel exciting and feel new every day. Uh, that's kind of a part of it for me is, uh, is sort of uh, 
trying to find a way to convey information that I haven't, uh, that I haven't used before. Um, and yeah, I, th I think part of it is kind of intuitive, but having a, I'm a person who, you know, limitations help me a lot. So being like, okay, I've done this, 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 and this. What can I do um, with what information I know needs to be conveyed in this panel, in this page? How can I present that in the most like creative way possible, in a way that's going to draw someone in, in a way that's going to, uh, you know, I want people to remember the pages um, and for them to be, you know, striking as well as informative. Um, so yeah, it takes, it's definitely the, the plotting out how the pages are structured and the panel structures is the part of this that takes the longest for me. Inking and all of that, it's a breeze. Once everything is kind of laid out, once the like house is built, you know, doing all of the little, the finishing details is kind of, but yeah, this is a, the mapping out each page I think is where the most kind of brain power goes. Um, can, can you quickly um, repeat the title and tell us when we can look for your next book? Oh, yes, uh, so it's coming out with first, second, uh, it's called The Twelfth House. 2025, I believe, um, I'm inking currently, like I said, it's, it's kind of a big boy. Um, and, um, but 2025, I believe, is uh, the, the, the tentative publishing date for now. Um, wow. <laughs> so how, how, did you, um, how did you feel about taking on a project that is that big? Well, this particular book is, um, it was actually, it was my senior thesis in college, and it's kind of the comic that I got into comics to make. Like, this is very much, um, which is also partially why it's taking so long, because I'm having to, uh, you know, kill my darlings a lot, and stop, I'm, I've been very precious about a lot of parts of this, because it's been kind of in the slow cooker for a very long time, um, and now that it's becoming, you know, a reality, it's sort of, I'm having to focus more on what the actual comic is going to be and how it's going to live outside of my head. Um, and uh, it's very nerve wracking because it is, you know, it's such a, it's so dear to me. Um, and it is also, you know, kind of the biggest thing that I have done that I'm, I'm responsible for all of it. You know, it all, if it's, uh, that's kind of the wonderful thing about, you know, the comics that you write and draw where it's like you do every single part, every bit of success or every bit of failure, everything that works or doesn't is all, you know, it all hinges on you. Um, but I'm I mean, I'm just, I couldn't be more excited about it. It's really, it's, it's a dream to be able to, you know, to, to work so hard on something that means so much to me. Hi, I have maybe kind of an odd question, but I work with kids in after school programs in the intersection of art and technology. So a lot of times people who like don't understand like zines or comics who understand how those things really do marry together and can kind of become one in the same working both analog and digital. Mm -hmm. um, people who don't get that, they're like, oh, you're like teaching kids to code or you're teaching kids to do all of these like very hard science STEM things. And I wonder if you could speak to in your work how you know technology when you do it in communications or in your process of like drawing and stuff kind of marry together or work together or are they separate for you? I mean, I'm a, a mostly digital artist and have been for, you know, quite some time. So it's, a, I would kind of be nowhere without, a, you know, a certain level of, of, of technological know-how. Um, I think uh, working anything that I know about, you know, about coding or about tech at all has been through comics and has been through sort of learning how to make and print and distribute my comics. Um, I found it to be an incredible resource just in terms of uh, streamlining um, because I think, you know, there's a difference between making comics and making comics for a living. And um, I think the speed at which you have to produce things um, when you're doing this professionally, uh, I have found that the the help of you know of tech uh, has really it smooths out the uh, all of the edges that are not just drawing and just doing design. Um, yeah, was that an answer to your question? I'm sorry. Hi, Hi. thank you so much for being here. Um, so I guess my question is, um, how did you kind of overcome like the the fear and the doubts of going into the comic industry? Um, I think that <laughs> there was a certain amount of it. I have been very, very, very tunnel visioned from uh, like the moment that I figured out that if comics exist, that means that someone is making them and that means that it is someone's job to make them. Like the minute that that kind of clicked in my brain in high school, 
I zeroed in probably to a, a degree that wasn't great for me. I was like, well, this is what I'm going to do. Like, this is the only thing that I could do. Why would anyone want to do anything else? Um, and so I think there was a certain part of that just like compulsion that this felt like a necessary, like it didn't feel optional, you know? It was like, I need to try to do this. And if I like crash and burn and fail spectacularly, then I will have done that on the way to trying to, you know, to make these things that I love to make. Um, and so I think there is a certain part of that just sort of like stubborn tunnel visionness where I was like, yes, I feel all these doubts, I feel all of this, but at the end of the day, I need to make, like I need to just like get this out of me and I need to, um, which I think is how, is how a lot of artists feel where it's just, you know, um, it's almost not a choice that you make. Um, uh, and I do think for better or for worse, that kind of helped where it was like, yeah, if, if people hate it, if no one gets it, if it's ugly and terrible and all that, I, I almost don't have a choice in it, you know? So it will be what it will be and people will feel however they feel, but it is important to me to make it. And, and I still feel that way, you know, where it's like, even if, if no one reads any of the books that I make for the rest of my life, it has made my life better to make them. And it makes it easier for me to be alive, you know, to just produce them. And so the results and who responds to them or doesn't respond to them almost becomes inconsequential, you know? Um, because it's just such a, a special and personal and private thing. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's a lovely note to end on. Um, and uh, will you be downstairs? Yes, I think I'm doing a signing right after this, um, down at the... Everybody get yourselves down there. <laughs> thank you all so much for thank coming. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>